Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool jukebox video for you this evening. We got in this really cool Rockola jukebox that I wanted to show off a little bit, so I figured I'd do a video of it. Uh, this is a Rockola 469 from 1977. And uh, I think it's finally getting time where people are starting to realize how cool these Rockolas are. For a long time, I don't think people uh, really liked these 70s boxes much, but this is a really neat one, I think. So it's uh, it's very similar to all of their other boxes. If you're if you're not that familiar with juke boxes, or the you know the specifics of them, the uh, the inside is very similar from year to year to year. But every year they would come out with a uh, two new models, or at least that's how Rockola did it. I think most of the major companies did it. So this is a 469, the same year they came out with a 470, which looks just like it, but it's a little bit wider because it, it plays 80 records. This one plays 50 records. Now they're 45s, of course, so they're double-sided. So you have 100 selections in this one, and then there was the 470, which was 160 selections. So it just depends on the location. Now when people are putting them in their home, which is pretty much the only thing you'd use them for now. People would, you know, just want them for one for their house. They kind of like these smaller ones a little better. Some people call these like the princess model and stuff like that. It just means a smaller, the smaller version instead of the larger version. So I've never had this particular model, but I've always seen pictures of it and thought it was really cool. Because again, it's 1977 and they just kind of like were thinking the hell with it, you know? So, so they... They just came up with a pretty stylish design for 1977. Now, when I was a kid, back in the day, I was born in 78. Back in the day, like in the 90s, when I was, when I was a little younger, not a kid, but um, yeah, I was a kid then. Uh, the, the 70s were thought of as like, you know, a low point in culture. You know, people didn't like the style. They said everything was ugly. All of this wood grain, like on the side of this, was ugly. Wood paneling was ugly, all of that. And I think I've, I never thought it was. When I was a kid, I always thought that stuff looked cool to me. Um, and I think I've seen the day come when people are finally starting to uh, appreciate it, even if it's just the hipsters. But that's all right. We like the hipsters, too. Um, but this is a particularly good-looking box. And I, I had, I've been wanting to get one of these for a while, and we finally ran across one. A gentleman had a couple of them uh, that he'd been hanging on to forever, and it didn't work. We bought them from him, and we're able to fix it up uh, kind of um, with haste. <laughs> it, not, I shouldn't say with haste, but we, we liked it, so we just got right on it, and we got it working. So I'm going to show you kind of how these are set up. So if you are a jukebox person or you've got one at your house that's busted up, I'm just going to walk through it a little bit and tell you what I think and what pops in my head and the things I've learned working on them over the years. And uh, then we'll play it a little bit. I'll probably do a separate video that I'll upload separately from this one right after we upload this one um, so that I can play some actual licensed music and don't have to worry about the copyright police going nuts on me and canning this cool video where we're going to show you all about this jukebox. So it has the wood grain sides. And again, people, this is just the design choice. They just wanted it to look like this, so that's why they did that. So it has the wood grain signs. It's kind of like a, a walnut. I don't know if I have a... Um, that that look is just like the... Or very similar to like the Miss Pac-Man cocktail arcade games. I've got a centipede over here. So get a gander of that and that. Right, and then I've got a centipede cocktail game over here. Very similar. They were kind of doing the same thing. This was 1981, I believe, um, and uh, this was 1977. So we're right in the era of wood grain. But they did this crazy like design on the front. Now that's just kind of like a like a it's kind of three-dimensional. That's kind of hard to see. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. There's two pieces there. There's a front piece and a back piece. So there's a little bit of depth to that. 
there's it looks like there's like uh, a quarter inch between the two pieces so the black is painted on the front but the orange is behind it about a quarter inch and there's a gap in between there or at least that's how it appears it may just be that something silk screened on the front and then something silk screened on the back of a quarter inch thick piece of glass uh, the black paint down there is factory so they, they have like the like a speaker grill on it and it's basically got like a flat spray painted black piece on it now it looked real good when we got it but we thought man is that factory I mean that's kind of almost looks like somebody just spray painted it like that yeah that's factory um, and up here it says Rockola integrated circuit solid state stereophonic music system right so integrated circuit being different than solid state solid state I guess they're saying no tubes and integrated circuit they're saying they have actual IC chips inside of the uh, amplifier and there's a little bit in the, well I think that's it I don't think there's any in the power supply so you've got the same effect on the back and if you look close it it's a woman really so see her face she has very curly eyelids you can see her ear all right she's looking that way and she's got very long hair and it's all going out here all right and then if you look down here, like this one again, that's a woman too. It's the same woman. So she's running or something. So you can see a little curve here. Look, look, look how they hit it from us. That's obviously a leg. Here's her chest. Here's her face again. The crazy eyelids. And then she's got all kinds of hair. Look at all that. So it's just a really unique kind of design that I always thought was cool. Now they did several of these where it has this top piece with the speakers on it and they all look like this. It almost looks like it's bent or something, like somebody has has bent the thing. But it's not. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. And you can kind of see why if you go around. It's a... Uh, I mean I'm sure there's plenty of reasons but one of the reasons is so it can sit flat against the wall. That thing doesn't stick out from the back. It's kind of bent. Then, of course, all this was designed um, by a, an engineer or an artist or whoever that really knew their stuff. So I just think this is a very nice looking box. The speakers up, up top here have this strange kind of baffle looking thing on it. But it's all just for effect. Like there's the the actual speaker is just, you know, normal. All right. So, very, very cool. All right, so I'm going to pull it out a little bit, and uh, we're going to look in the... I'm going to show you what, what you can see from the back with the door removed. Okay, so there is a metal door that pops off. Really easy. You just reach inside, and there are these three little clips that you push down. And again, if you've got a 469, this is how it works, but if you've got a, a Rockola within, you know, five to ten years either way of this box, it's going to work really similar. So this is a 1977. All of the ones back to the early 70s and up till, you know, the mid 80s all worked very similar. It's got very heavy uh, huckles. <laughs> here to help pick it up All right. and then here on the back you have this little bad boy so this is basically how you hook up external speakers so all of these screws basically see how they have the lines on ground and then on four that's basically because there's a transformer in there that has all, it's right under it actually, that has all different taps on it. And you can change that 
depending on how many speakers you have hooked up. So if you hook up external speakers, you move these farther down so that there's not, uh, uh, basically it's a wattage thing, you know, since depending on the uh, impedance of all of the speakers added together. So there is actually a little chart here. I need to glue that back on a little better. On the back of the door. Let me see, let me see if I can read it for you. So let's see, it says auxiliary speaker, wall blocks, wall blocks, wall box, <laughs> and remote motorized volume control terminal block. So they're showing you this, and then the wall box connections, and the eternal, the external, I can't talk today, the external volume control and the cancel switch, etc., etc. So all of that can be hooked up onto that thing. Now, the wall box, if you don't know about those, you could actually hook up a separate selector, basically, to, you know, that's why in the old, you know, soda shops and stuff that everybody talks about or people used to talk about, they would have one at each table that you could make selections at, right? So if you look, all of that would connect here. Wall box counter, the lockout, signal line, common, audio control, left speaker, audio ground, and right speaker. Right. So that's how all that. Never connect speakers without matching transformer to the 70 volt lines. Okay, so it's going to tell you that if you are using only the speakers in the phonograph, you want to hook it up to ground and four. That's how they have it, right? Now you notice there's a five. Apparently, you should never hook it up to 5. You might want to turn it up to 12, but don't do it, folks. So depending on which ones, and this is per channel, left and right, depending on what you've got, you can hook up 32 16-ohm speakers to one channel as long as you, you uh, the terminal connections are to ground and one. And it's saying phono speaker terminal connections. Okay, they're talking about the actual phonograph speakers. So leave them disconnected if you're hooking up 32 16-ohm speakers. Disconnect the ones inside the machine. So anyway, they've all kind of got something like that going on. right? Now also here from the back, you can get to the cam switches. There's a cam here that turns. I'll show you here in a minute. Whenever it picks up a record, it's going to turn around, and that cam there will hit these four switches. There's two on top of each other. We'll hit these four switches at certain intervals, and that's kind of what makes everything work. So if you've got problems where yours isn't moving right, something's not something's not coming on at the right time, it gets to a certain spot and stops, it's usually, well, it can be the connections on these switches. So you might have to remove the wire from the switch, it'll just slide off, and clean it. Sometimes they're just really tarnished from the years. You can clean these connections and then plug them back in and get it to go again. But, you know, it's, it's not as simple as doing that. But sometimes, if you've got an intermediate problem, it could be one of those cam switches. Uh, so it's something to look at. Now, also here on the back, this is actually your amp right here. Okay. Now, on the amp, there is a volume control. Usually, on most jukeboxes, that will not have a knob on it. It's just a little shaft. And the reason for that is because... If you put it in a bar, you don't really want the drunks over there figuring out <laughs> where the uh, volume knob is on the jukebox. So it's almost kind of hid. There's nothing on it to draw attention to it. Now sometimes you'll find one and it's somebody's mounted a knob on there. And I'm sure they probably made one at Rockola that you could buy. But I'm pretty sure they did not come with a knob because if I get 30 of them, one of them has a knob on it. It's, it's literally like that. Now that little button below it is the cancel switch. You hit that and it will cancel any record that's playing. So you might cancel it because you don't like Garth Brooks. Or you might cancel it because uh, Reba keeps skipping. right? And then of course an on-off switch. This is the, actually the back of the power supply that you're looking at here. Big old power transformers. Okay, So this is a pretty good one here. This, is, this thing's in pretty decent shape. Now the, the cabinet is kind of all particle board. 
right? So if they get really wet, uh, you'll start having things like the, the wheels coming up through the bottom of the cabinet and you just run into problems. However, all of the stuff that matters is metal. So the entire movement, like the, the entire mechanism, just about everything on it's metal. So with a few exceptions, even if the thing gets flooded, if you get that thing clean again, you should be able to get it running again. The cabinet might be falling apart. But you can see that they've stiffened it up with big brackets and things because you can imagine that this thing's fairly heavy. Just the records alone is fairly heavy. So, All right, so that's the back, the back of it. Now, on this particular model, there's a little door here you can open with a key to get to the back of the speakers. So let's look inside the front. All right, so that's it opened up. Very easy to do. You just turn the key. Now the door on this one, the top, um, has springs. So on this particular model, they're always in good shape because it's just a metal spring. Uh, on some of them, they put in gas shocks or gas struts, which are or gas springs, I guess they call them. Um, kind of like you would have on like a hatchback car. Those wear out. And by the way, there is a I don't know if that's a, that's probably not a coin counter, that's a play meter. So the coin counter went over here somewhere according to that uh, manual or that that little legend we were looking at. The door you can see all of the dirt that always accumulates on the edge. Uh, two tins it looks like, I believe. Um, this is your power supply over here. On these models, by this time they had circuit breakers instead of fuses in a lot of places, so these three uh, circuit breakers here, you might have pop if one of your motors tries to overheat because it's trying to turn too much. Your stop relay and your right end relay, and then your play relay. You can see where the wall box plugs in there. Okay, and then here is the amplifier. The microphone plugs in up here. Right. And then your your Amplifiers. Now remember, by this time, Rockola had been doing it a long time. They kind of knew what they were doing. Uh, so that's a mute relay up there on the top. And then you have uh, equalization uh, settings there that you can easily move. You've got gain adjustments that can be done from the front through those little grommets there. And then you've got a channel balance there. Um, very easily adjustable. You can see that the auto volume control the ABC um, is always on. You can take it off if you want to test it, but it's always on. The reason for that is just some records are loud, some records are quiet, so they wanted to, to they wanted to equalize that. You can put it on stereo or mono. Pickup plugs in there. You can see where it's grounded to that screw right next to it. And then there's a scratch filter because the records are old. <laughs> It's got a pretty good scratch filter, too. It works pretty good. The coins would fall down through this coin uh, selector, and then depending on which coin it was, it would hit a different leaf switch over here on the side. We never really mess with that. Everybody always wants it on free play. Um, what else to show you? Oh, this is cool. Here is the credit unit. For the older ones. This is the the play meter basically. Not, not the the meter was the one we showed back there, but this basically keeps track of what selections they're playing. There's a piece of paper missing. There's supposed to be a ring around here that tells you the different numbers. And if you push that in it resets them, or I guess it does. We never mess with that either. Uh, but basically, that was very important if you were operating it. So, 
you'd come in and you'd look at them, right? And whichever one wasn't all the way out or wasn't out at all, it's because nobody played that record. So you've got a new record here that you want to put in. Well, you want to make sure you put it in to replace a record that nobody's listening to. Because what if everybody's listening to uh, 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 Clint Black or something, and you take the Clint Black record out and then put the new one in there, and the new one ain't really that good, and you just shot yourself in the foot. You took out everybody's favorite record and replaced it with, with one that may or may not be good. And you, that's really kind of the only way to do it, because if you ask the people, you're going to get all kinds of different stories. Oh, yeah, boy, I love that one. And they only play it, they played it twice, and nobody else has ever played it, you know. So, um, so this was like the popularity meter, I guess they would call it. Um, and then they would reset it each week and then come back the next week and see what people didn't like. So, you have right here a scan off operate switch. So, off is exactly what you would think it was. Now, scan moves this basket over here. So let's say you want to swap a record. You just move to wherever you are, pull the record out, put the new one in, and uh, that's how that works, right? Okay, now if you just turn it back to operate, it will go back to its home position and park. Okay, you can notice that the turntable was turning while that was going on. Now, if you wanted to change the little label, there is a label panel here that these little clips allow to drop down and you can just slide the new tags in. So it's really easy. One of the most common misconceptions that we hear from people is that they say, does it still have the records in it? Or they'll say, does it still have the original records in it? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, none of them have the original records in it. Or they'll, they'll, uh, they don't understand that they can put whatever records they want in it. You have to literally explain that to people. About, I would say half of the customers don't get that. And it's not because they're idiots or something. It's just because they've never thought of it. You know, the thing was sitting over there in the corner like this. They never saw anybody swap the records out. They don't, they don't know how it works, you know. So they don't realize that it's really easy to put whatever record you want in it. All you got to do is get the record. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you it picking one up, but we're not going to play it. And the reason is because YouTube will demonetize the video or take it down or block it from playing in certain countries or whatever <laughs> if they don't like uh, that we're playing it. But I'll show you what it does. So I'm going to type in uh, numbers. And basically, this selector up here the buttons are going to stick down because this latch coil is going to come on. Right? So let's just do two, four, and they the, the buttons themselves didn't stick, but it. Let me turn it off. So what it did while we weren't looking, or I guess I can do another one. Let me see if it, turning that off is turned off the right end. Okay, so that's called the right in circuit, W-R-I-T-E-N. So that spins around and using these little fingers and these little contacts on that plate there, it finds the exact spot that you typed in. So I typed in 121 or whatever. And when it finds that spot, it stops, and this little coil here kicks over that little pin. You can see the little pin sticks through the side of the plate. They call this the, the selector wheel or the wobble plate. See how that one has been knocked over, this one? That's the one that knocked over a second ago, uh, whenever we weren't looking. Okay, So when that happens... A little thing moves in there and it makes this switch up here come on, which tells it that there's a selection. So anytime any of these are knocked over, that little switch will be closed. So it knows that there's selections. 
So if you have a problem where this thing never moves, you've probably got a problem with inside of your selectors, your buttons up here. You might try spraying them with contact cleaner while you press them in and out violently. Uh, or it could be a bad connection somewhere. If the thing moves around and it never stops, that's because it can't find where it's supposed to go. So you might have the contacts there on the side of that plate need to be cleaned. If the thing stops like this one has, but this side never starts moving, it's probably because something's going on with that switch up there, or it could still be uh, connector issues, you know. So I'm going to turn it back to scan, and what happens after you write in a selection, now remember we put two in, it can store them because it just knocks over the levers physically. So this one's over, and one down there is over. So now that those are in, this switch is on, so this side has power. Okay, so I've got it in off right now so it can't move, but whenever I put it to operate, okay. So it turned around, and look where it stopped. It stopped where that little lever is pushed over. It found it. And the way it found it was when that lever pushes over, it pushes it out into the path of that thing, and literally it just contacts it. Like the metal, there's a little metal piece on this uh, uh, read out, so this is write in and read out. This read out side actually touches that little metal tab and goes, hey, there's something right in the middle of the damn road. And it stops to see if the driver needs assistance. Okay, and so once that happens, there is a contact made through that, blah, 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 and it turns everything on. So this cam here, the, and that right out arm, readout arm, is attached to the basket. So wherever it goes, the basket goes. So when it gets to that spot, it has turned, and the basket has turned, and we're lined up perfectly with whatever record that is. Right? So once it, it makes that, that electrical connection, uh, a relay, I think under the, under the uh, turntable, there are a couple more relays down there in a box. But a relay connects, and it starts one of these motors turning this cam. So this cam is like just a hell of an invention. Basically, it's gears and pistons and all kinds of stuff, right? And it starts turning. Well, as it's turning on the back, it's hitting those switches that we showed a second ago, right? But because of the way this is all geared and the way it's all built and everything and the gears have little gaps in them and stuff, it will do the exact same thing over and over again. So it's since it's turning, the gears are turning, and it's making all of this do this incredible little work that it does, where basically this, this bar starts pulling in. And so that's what's happened here. It has pulled in and grabbed the record. It's actually pinching it. Look at that. And because that bow has moved, it's now touching it on both sides of the record. And this thing is made a certain a certain way so that it can perfectly pick up a 45 7-inch record. Okay, now as the gear keeps turning, eventually it's going to get to a spot where it decides that that's pulled in all of the way. And then it's going to start, since it's still turning, lifting the whole thing up in the air. Right? Okay. <laughs> So it's still turning, and still turning, and still turning, and still turning, and still turning. But if you look here, there is a little tail piece there that is held in place as it goes through that little nub that's sticking up there. So once that clears that, and the record is pretty much straight up in the air, on this side, there is a little metal piece here that's going to hit the side of that of that uh, tail piece and make this bow flip around 90 degrees. Now if that little thing was on the other side, see the other one over there? It's not engaged. So it hasn't turned in. So that thing is either like this or it's like this. So either way, one of them is going to hit the back of that tail piece.
and it spins it around by doing that. And you can see how it's perfectly got it gripped. Right? Now this is not a motor doing this, a motor doing that, a motor doing this, a motor doing... No, this is one motor turning a cam and everything's geared to where it just automatically does it. And then whenever it ends, it'll do it the exact opposite backwards. Okay, so remember it's got this held perfectly, right? Bam! So it's perfectly lined up where it throws it down perfectly on the center of the freaking turntable. But now it can't, it can't turn because it's still holding the freaking record. So the last thing, or one of the last things it's going to do, is it's going to allow this bow to move that way. So by doing that, it's now completely let go of the record. And the record is on the turntable, which is spinning. And so the gear keeps turning. And when it turns this cam on the back of the gear, not to be confused with the cam over there that was hitting the switches, it picks up the freaking tone arm and brings it over. And sets it down to wherever you have it adjusted. I think this one's adjusted a little bit too far in, but... And right when it gets above the record, it reduces the voltage so that it, it, it basically slows down so that it drops it slowly on the record, right? So that's how the things work. Let's see if we got any volume. Probably not the one you remember, Jose Feliciano. All right, so when it plays all the way through, <coughs> it's going to get towards the runout groove in the middle. And when it does, that means this arm will have physically moved, right? And the tail of the arm, you can't even see it here, but. I haven't even looked at this one. Where is it? Where are you? Yeah. The tail of the arm is going to hit a switch. Well, I can't get you a good look at it. Basically, t take my word for it, <laughs> there's a switch back there that it hits. And once it hits the switch, that's the cancel switch. So it's wired to the cancel switch on the back that's behind this plate, by the way, on the back of the machine, right under the volume control. And that switch actually tells it to hang it up. Now, if you've got a problem with that switch or the button on the back or a wire is not connected or something, it will never hang up. It'll just get into the runout groove and just keep running. And I get a lot of people emailing and calling and stuff because they've got one that's doing that. Um, <clears throat> If you've got one that will cancel and hang up the record, but the button on the back doesn't work, a lot of times that is this connection right here. This, this connection gets screwed up where it pulls out of the record, out of the amp. You can see this one's like that. The little connector is broke. Uh, where that's not making a good contact. It may be this one. It's one of these two connections. Well, if that happens, it will still hang up because that cancel switch out here is what controls the power that's running through all of, all of the switches and everything that will hang it up okay but the one on the back won't work because when you hit it you're trying to ground a signal or whatever that comes out here and it won't it won't connect you'll also notice that sometimes it won't cancel out here but it'll cancel if you hit the switch on the back if it cancels out here but won't with the switch, a lot of times the mute relay won't come on because the uh, that wire is also what turns on the mute relays. 
So if there's a bad connection here, one switch or the other may, may or may not work. And if this one is working and that one isn't, the mute relay won't come on. <laughs> so it's interesting. So when it gets to the end, it's going to hang it up. And what it's going to do is it's just going to go exactly backwards of what it did before. It's just going to start turning the motor the other way. And um, so the first thing it has to do is get the tone arm out of the way. And uh, then after, when it does, by the way, you'll see it, this little brush here, right there, move over the stylus to clean it off, to clean the dirt off of it that it probably just picked up off of the record. Um, and then when it does that, at the same time, it will start moving this piston in, the bow, to grab the record again. And then it will pick it up and spin it, and then once it gets where it's 90, it'll hang it right up. We'll see if we can catch any of it. So it's getting near the runout groove. I think it is. Kind of sounds like it's skipping. Come on, Jose Feliciano. Nope, it's not skipping. He was just going for dramatic effect. That's the part of the record where it calms down. He's screaming again now. He's yelling at some chick named Susie Q. Drum solo. I didn't pick the long. It's 5 minutes and 14 seconds long. What in the world? It says it's 514. Here we go. It's going to do it. Did you hear the click? Right? So it moved over and click <laughs> the switch and everything started going backwards. So this is moving in to grab the record and the stylus is already off of the record and it's about to put it back where it was. Okay, so we're out of the way. Now watch the watch the the brush. Now this has pretty much grabbed it and it's about to pick it up. But at the same time that it does that, you're going to see that brush over the stylus. <laughs> Did you catch it? So now the brush is over here. And you can adjust that. There is a little screw on it. So you can raise it and the brush just moves right through the the, the needle. All right. It's a Shure N44 cartridge for all of you audiophiles out there. So it's got our record. Boy, things look sketchy right now, but it's only halfway through. So that same pin is now hitting the, the, the tailpiece to spin it back around. We're pretty much all the way back. None of this has moved because it wants to put it back right where it found it. So now it's all the way down, but it's still holding it. So the last thing it does is it pushes the, the bow out to let go of the record. And once it gets to a certain spot, remember all of this was done with that cam. So once it gets all the way back, it hits a switch or opens a switch or closes a switch. And that switch turns on the motor that turns the basket. So you can't turn that basket unless it's all the way at one extreme because it wants to make sure that it's not, the bow's not in the way or that it's not holding the record whenever it starts spinning because it'd break off not only the edges of that record, but every other one of them in the basket, right? So they've got a switch where the, it can, it kills power to it, and uh, it switches the power back and forth between it and um, the gripper motor, right? So normally it would go back home, but it's not going to go back home because it knows that there's another, another selection. Now how does it know there's another selection? Like I said, if if it has any, if it has one selection, as long as one of those pins is flipped over, this switch up here is closed, right? So it knows there's still a selection. So it's gonna it's gonna travel around and look for it, and you can see that as it turns, the basket turns, right? And so it's gonna get around to there and find it. It found it. 
Bam. Right? And see where the readout arm is? It's right where the right in arm is because that was the last selection. Now if I hit the button on the back, A little skip on that one. If I hit the button, and now it'll go to home because there's no more selections. Bam. So there you go. They're cool little machines, but really they're very logical. They're all similar. So if you get if you get a Rockola, it's gonna work pretty much exactly like that. Um what a cool machine. So the last thing I want to show you is how it looks with the lights off. Beautiful box. It just it looks great. That's one of the coolest ones, I think. But I, I love all these Rockolas. I, I think I probably like them just because I know how to work on them a little bit, just because I've messed with a lot of them. So I'm not saying anything bad about your Seabirds or your NSMs or your Whirlitzers. Or you can't uh, you can't forget the the mighty row AMI right? It's all good stuff too. So I'll show you the songs. So all of these songs are just records that we've picked up and put in the machine because we're giving them away. Trying to predict the type of music that the customer is going to want to hear is very hard. And they're not all, you know, perfect quality records. A lot of them have scratches, skips, it's just stuff we've picked up here and there. By the way, Rockin' Robin is the first song I can ever remember hearing. I can remember my mom playing that for me whenever I was five. It was the first I ever remember hearing music. And we put in the Mississippi Squirrel Revival for our buddy Nate, who I know is watching over in New Zealand. Because <laughs> he's a nut. All right, folks, so there you go. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to film a separate video here in about two minutes, playing the hell out of this thing. But like I said, I can't upload it as part of this video, or they, they will block either block this whole video, demonetize the whole video, or whatever. So I'm not going to do that and let them steal all my damn good content. So <laughs> if you've seen this video and it's been five minutes, now unless you watch this whole video in five minutes, there's no way in hell that I don't have the other video uploaded yet, right? So <laughs> the other video will be uploaded immediately after this one. On our channel, I'll put uh, Rockola 469 in the title. So if you need to search it out, you can find it or whatever, but it'll be uploaded directly after this video on our channel. So it's a twofer today. So I hope you enjoyed the little walkthrough of the rock oil. You might have noticed too, there's a bunch of oil in there. The main problem that these have is the mechanism has this old oil. Do you see the like the orange looking stuff in there? That's the original oil that's all caked up and it gets like, it's like, uh, I don't even know what you would compare it to. It's almost as thick as paint. It's like it's painted on there or something. And uh, you can't, it's hard to clean it all off, you know, but basically all of that's inside of the mechanism where all that, that piston was and everything, where all that stuff's moving, all of that oil is in there and that stuff dries hard as a rock. So the problem with almost every one of these machines is that original oil and grease has dried up. So the reason you saw oil dripped all over the place is because we soak these suckers and uh, try to get some of that stuff to... Uh, to uh, loosen up a little bit. Uh, you can take them completely apart and remove all of that stuff by hand if it's, depending on the severity of it. If the thing's been played a lot over the years, sometimes you can just oil it and it'll work fine. If it's sticking and it ain't working right or it's really, it's, it's seized up, you need to take it all the way apart. Uh, I had one gentleman uh, that I was conversing with on email about his uh, trying to help him out, uh, figure out what was going on with his. And I kept telling him, man, it's that freaking, it's got to be that grease. 
and he eventually had to use a heat gun to to get some of that crap to liquefy again uh, to, so that he could take the mech apart and clean it all out. Now we have a video here on our channel. Uh, if you search Rockola Mechanism on our channel, it'll show you how to disassemble the whole thing. By the way, if you want to know how to search on just one person's channel, if you click channel and just look at our channel, and then you go over to the right side, you'll see a little a little Sherlock Holmes hourglass, uh, spyglass, uh, magnifying glass. Just click that, and it will search just that channel. And that works on everybody's channel. It's just one of the features of YouTube. If you search up in the top bar, the top box, you get results from all over YouTube. But if you go to our channel and just search on our channel, uh, there's also a playlist for all of these Rockola jukeboxes. I think there's like 25 videos in there or something. So, But uh, you can watch that if you're having trouble with yours. But I hope this uh, helped you understand a little bit how they work. Once you figure out how they work, you go, oh... Oh, the deal with the amplifier is it's always on. It's just muted. So when the record, um, whenever that needle drops, it unmutes the mute relay. And the sound is processed through the amplifier, amplified through the, the amplifier. Um, we don't have a ton of amplifier problems. There's some little boards in there that you can recap and things, but they're pretty, they're pretty reliable. Um, so if you, if you have problems with that, that's a whole other subject, but basically just the, the way the thing functions is just a work of art in my opinion. So leave your comments below and let us know what you think. Make sure to give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film it for you. We didn't have to do all that folks. I'm here late tonight doing this, but we appreciate everybody that watches. Make sure to check out my brother Donnie's channel. I had somebody the other day say, how come you never tell us the name of his channel? That is the name of his channel. It's the My Brother Donnie channel. So My Brother Donnie has his own channel here on YouTube. Uh, go check that out. I'm over there with him a lot. Joey and I, my other brother, work on arcade games, jukeboxes, and pinball machines. My brother Donnie uh, works on old vehicles, old buildings, and he has a farm with cows and goats. So go check that out. I'm over there with him on his channel a lot. But I'll see you back here in five minutes where we can play this thing.